was wrong, and then we have an answer. Thank you, everybody, for coming out to Norse Central Beekeepers Club tonight. How many of you are here for Beekeeping 101? Yay! We'll be sending you out the back in just a few minutes. How many of you are signed up for Bee School on Saturday? Even better, Debbie, did you see that turnout? How many people are signed up for Bee School on Saturday? Yay! Woo! does not know what the jump starter program is. So this <coughs> not too bad, it's about 50-50. Um, the jump starter program is a program that the Beekeepers of Indiana started two years ago. And what we do is we partner with all the local clubs. And for partnering with the local club, we provide woodenware, we provide the tools, the smoker, and the local club actually provides the protective clothing and a mentor and of course, the recipient of the Jumpstart program. So um, your club, what actually happens is the local clubs actually submit them to us. The state association does not pick them. We don't know the people in your club. We want to make sure it is somebody coming to your club every month. Uh, and then you guys submit them, and actually the winner is Danielle. Yeah, say that right, because I have two that are kind of alive. <laughs> um, and so she actually was the winner of the Jumpstart program this year for your club, and we'd like to believe picture. So please give her a round of applause. Tracy is actually her mentor. Yay. So if y'all would... Uh, Bronte went through our 4-H beekeeping project and Danielle came along and learned a lot there mm -hmm. and they have a lovely spot in Zionsville so we're going to be able to get them going this spring and they're signed up for B-School too. Right. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> So thank you, beekeepers of Indiana, for being so generous. I appreciate it. So anybody who's a new beekeeper, next year we'll be doing this again. Uh, Danielle and uh, Bronte are going to continue to come and then they'll, to our club meetings, but they'll also provide quarterly updates to beekeepers of Indiana that will be included in the magazine, uh, the newsletter that goes out to everyone. So they have a bit of a responsibility as well, but that is something that beginner beekeepers might be able to think about for next year. So. Every year we have an opportunity to have a candidate. The only thing that disallows you is if we do not get reports from your recipient or your mentor. Yeah. So then that makes you in a, in eligible next year. So very quickly what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk to you about the state association. Um, your state association does a, does a lot of things for you that the local organizations don't have the funds, don't have the means to do. Um, one of them, of course, is we put on the B-School. The B-School is attended by over a thousand people. This year we brought in two international speakers, so we're really excited about that. And we knew it was going to fill up early. We knew it was going to fill up early and it was going to fill up fast. So um, we just want to encourage you to sign up early next year if you did not get signed up this year. One of the things, one of the benefits of being a member, have you guys seen this this year? Playing back there on the table. This actually is the application for 2019. If you are not a member, I'd encourage you to pick one of these up uh, and become a member of our state association because one of the benefits is you get to be the first person who knows about the next event coming up. So if the B school filled up in two months, the members of the association were the first ones that got the application. And it actually, I don't put it on the website until the application or uh, until it actually the newsletter goes out. So I can't have people signing up on the, on the website before our members actually have the opportunity, okay? This is one of the other things you get. You get a quarterly newsletter. Uh, the newsletter is full of all kinds of really fun, neat information about the event coming up. 
It also has information about the event that just passed. It has all the financials in here. Um, and it also has um, something in here in the middle. It actually is from the state APR inspector. But the coolest thing is if you have someone in your club that writes an article, you actually could potentially see your picture in the back where it says public. <coughs> It is about all the things that are going around in the state of Indiana. In our 32, we have 32 local clubs getting ready to add two more. They're, they've gone through their second meeting, they'll go to their third, and then they'll be added to the, to the members on the back. So that's one of the other benefits they can get. There's going to be a test. You guys are taking notes, right? Okay. Um, another benefit you get is a roster. We are excited to... Oh, that was a secret. Um, we're excited to let you know that as of a week ago, we are now at over 2,000 members. That sounds pretty impressive, doesn't it? So, ooh, uh, yeah, there you go. Um, now, the interesting part, though, is that's probably about 20 to 25 percent of the beekeepers in the state of Indiana. Now, why would you not want to join the state association? Because you don't know so There you go. Enemy number one, don't know about it. Second thing, though, is a lot of beekeepers think that um, we go out and, and find where your hives are and tell everybody so they can steal them. And I'm not kidding. I've actually had somebody say, well, do I have to tell you where my hives are? Oh, I don't care where your hives are. I have enough trouble keeping, uh, keeping up with our AAP, so that's not a big problem for me. But that is one thing that you get. It is by county. Why would we do this by county and not alphabetical? Do you know all the, everybody's name in this room? There you go. When you, well, when you join. Yeah, you should have got a packet. I'll go look for you. When, before I leave, I need your last name to look up your packet and when it got sent. I send them um, priority, so I always have a tracking on them. Yeah. Um, but you should have got this. It comes out March 31st. Okay. And the reason why we do it by county is exactly what she said. If you're a new beekeeper, you don't know the names of the people in here, but you know where you live and you know people that are by you because all you have to do is pick up and look at the county. Call anybody in your county, see if they can help you out. Okay, so that's another thing you get. We always throw really cool things in here like recipes. We have, you guys know we have a, a national honey queen, right? And we have a national honey queen. This year we have a state honey queen. Uh, she will come and talk before your group if you would like for her to. But our national honey queen and princess actually will come as well. Um, they do the state fair. They'll do other events. Um, so if you're having a special event and you want her to come, just contact the person that's on the back of this recipe, and you'll actually be able to get them in there. Um, and then if anybody sends us um, something, you can get free. We like free. Someone, someone mentioned to me a while ago, um, the best color is free. So I like that. I'm going to have to use that. Um, so again, this is sitting in the back. So one thing that is the most important, probably worth the most in your new member packet is this letter. Because it's signed by me. Ooh. Ooh. There you go. There you go. So um, the one thing that we've been able to do this year is everybody going to the B school gets one of these books. Ooh. Yeah. How many in here don't have one of these books? Wow, a lot. I'm really surprised. Um, so you see what happens is I, I bring some little gifts because you guys let me come and talk, um, and which I'm very shy. I don't talk much. So, um, But anyway, so I bring these gifts, and I do a raffle. But you guys raise money by doing a raffle, so I don't want to do that because I don't want to take money away from your club. That's very beneficial for some of the programs we're doing. So what I'm going to ask, and you guys at the end have to help me because I don't know who's talking first. If you are on the board, you cannot answer. What is one of the benefits that you get for being a member of the state association? Yes, ma'am. Reduced rates at B school. What? Reduced rates at B school. That's partial answer. Hang on. And you in the back? Quarterly newsletter. Quarterly newsletter. You both get to pick whether you want this, which is the Baroa Guide, or one of these books. Now, let me explain why your answer was a partial. If you are, which one would you like? Are you coming to the B school? No. Okay, so let me give you a little answer is that as a member of the state association, 
you get $10 off as an adult, you get $10 off of every event that you go to. So help me out with a little math here, okay? Let's say you're an individual and you pay $15 to join the state association, which is how much it costs per year, $15, okay? You come to the B-School, you get $10 off the B-School, how much are you now out? $5. Come to Purdue Day, you, are, you get $10 back, now when you're out, you are $5 up. You come to the fall conference, which this year is at French Lick, and Randy Oliver is our guest speaker. We're really excited about that. Woo! How much now are you out? We have now paid you $15 to be a member of the state association that you got all of these fun things with as well. So that's a pretty good deal. Okay, let's take a couple. All right, we're going to do the math again. As a couple, it costs $20. Okay, to join per year. And that's if you don't do the multiple year. It gets cheaper through the multiple years. But let's say you get um, $20 to, to become a member and you go to B-School. You each got $10 off. You were even. Now you're even. You come to Purdue Day, you get another $20. Now you're ahead $20. And you come to the fall <coughs> meeting, another $20. Again, $40 off. You can thank two of the gentlemen that have disappeared in the back. <laughs> Barry McNulty and um, Jim Burns were on the committee when we were all talking about that and deciding that. So um, they were on the board at the time that got put in. So thank you for all that. And uh, let's give you a little bit of applause. Yeah, no, I did write back in that It's kind of fun because they're like, oh, I have to figure that out. Um, okay, so um, the other, the last thing I want to leave you with, I always say the last thing to you. You're laughing, you've probably heard this. The last thing is the legislature that is, <coughs> legislature that is going on. Are you guys up to date on that? We haven't talked about it yet. Okay. Are you going to? You want me to go ahead and, and talk about that? We'll, we'll talk about it. Okay, great. So um, we have killed the one bill, and Jim will tell you why. Um, we actually have some documentation that he can add, that he can um, talk to you about as well. All right. So I'm sorry. Oh, I have two more books up here. I'm going to give them away. You're laughing back there. So Terry's back there. You know Terry's your president this year, yeah? Give him a round of applause. He actually is your president for next year too. Do you know that? <laughs> but man, I'm sorry enough for one year. Um, okay, so who has traveled the longest to get here? You. Well, <laughs> okay. Besides me. Okay, I don't know where these places are. So more than 20 miles. Yeah. More, than 20 more than 30 miles. miles. Raise your hand. More than 40 miles. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have one person. More than 50 miles. <laughs> I think we're down to one person. Yeah, well, right. well, how, we how, how far did you say? Okay, great. Two's great. How far? 50 miles. 50 miles. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. We're talking about mileage, Johnny. What? <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, okay, so which one? No, you, you don't get to take him. You have to take one of the books. <laughs> okay, there you go. All righty, and you get to do that one. Yeah. So um, Purdue did a very good thing for us this year. They allowed us. They gave us a book to put in the B uh, in each of the bags for the B school. So we try to share if we have any extras. If you get one at the B school and you have one, please just be friendly to your other B neighbors and bring it and share it. Okay, because that would be the fun thing to do. Um, and the last thing that I will leave you with is um, I have not introduced Jeanette. Also serves on your board. So. <coughs> I do have new member packets if anybody wants to sign up now before I leave. And I put those out for the one on one people in the back. There's some up on the table. Yep, yep. there's some at the sign And table. you can mail them in if you like to, or you can just sign up online. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I should be. Yes, David Hopecote actually starts on your board as well. So, David, please stand up and. <laughs>
you want to. Um, I have one more announcement. So Kevin, raise your hand. Where's Kevin? Kevin Bowen is here, and he Bowen. I'm sorry, Kevin Bowen is here, and he left these flyers on the back table about hiveware and bees that he will have for sale this spring. These are carniolans that are coming out of Alvera stock in Northern California. Um, and so the flyer is very informative, has good detail, and um, those are on the back table. So if you're looking for woodware or bee supplies. He is here, and you can read your raise your hand again, and everybody else wants to see that. So you can talk to him at the break or afterwards. Do I have anything else other than, yes, sir? Package. Uh, oh, uh, package the, update. If you order packages, uh, With? Order, yeah, the order's been in, is in, and the pickup date is April the 6th. So unless something changes, we'll be, uh, April the 7th will be the pickup time for you guys. So we'll, we'll, we'll go to Kentucky on the 6th of April. Yeah. So be, your your pickup would be on the seventh. So I think we'll do it here. But we'll send emails out to everybody that's that's done that. Okay. So, Is that kind of fasting? No. Uh -uh. No. That was a separate order. No, fastings are not here tonight. Talked um, about Barry new building workshop. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in a second. Master Gardener plant sale is on May 18th. Where is that at? Hamilton yeah. County Fairgrounds. The Hamilton County Fairgrounds starts in Noblesville. at. What time does it start? Uh, it starts at 8 o'clock yep. till 3. Come early to get the good plants, come, come early. late to get the cheap plants. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So making deals at the end of the day. Yeah, we, we sell about 13,000 plants. So. Okay, and Cool Creek has a plant sale too? Anybody they, know about it? They start probably in March and go through September, October. At and the greenhouse? At the greenhouse, but you come in here to get somebody to go to the greenhouse. Okay. They have plants, shrubs, and trees. And mostly native plants, yes, right? Yes, native. So if you're interested in natives for your garden, it's a great place to get them. Uh, we have some raffle goodies for tonight. We've got a honey strainer over there. Uh, what we're going to do with the raffle yeah? is the honey strainer, the smoker, the suit, and the gloves, we're actually going to use as door prizes for the newbies. Okay. So and then that. so the other things, the towels, there's a subscription to uh, ABJ. ABJ. Um, there are two bee bath towels, some Very honey, nice, and some beer. I used them this morning. They're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. Coming up this fall, October 25th, put on your calendars now, save the date, the fall conference of the TBOI. Great event. I'm on the committee. Always make it a good time. Um, coming up, uh, future meetings. Is that, is that, does it start on Friday or? It starts on Friday night. The first keynote speaker is Friday night, and then it goes through the following Saturday. But some people just come for the Saturday. But, but you can come for the board meeting if you want. You can come for the board meeting on Friday afternoon if you are really into it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Open lake. And it's going to be a French Lake Resort, beautiful venue. If you've never been down there, great place to spend a weekend. Go gambling. Yes, go gambling. Um, next month, Dave, or no, this month, Dave Hocutt is going to be talking about query. <coughs> next month is Dave Shenafield talking about spring management. Dave is one of the better speakers we get in every year. People love to hear what he has to say. Then uh, in April, we're going to be doing a panel discussion on spring management, May 15th. <clears throat> I've got a flyer up here for this. We're having our annual field day, which we have been calling the Sustainable Apiary because it's the June previous 15. titles were confusing. Yeah. What? June 15th. June 15th. Let's do it then. June 15th. <laughs> um, we're having. We're bringing in a guest speaker, Mel Disselton <coughs> from Michigan. Um, Mel's written a book. He uh, speaks quite a bit on beekeeping and on queen rearing. Uh, it's well known. Um, this is one of the things we use money from things like the raffle for, is to bring in speakers like this from out of state to speak at these events. So we're expecting a big turnout, uh, and uh, we'll have this flyer at the back table if you're interested. Uh, we have we set a registration fee for this? We have not. It's not very expensive. It includes lunch. So it's usually a good event. But we'll be talking all about how to raise and produce your own bees and your own apiaries. You don't have to buy packages and nukes. Uh, okay, that's it there. There's a flyer for the nuke building workshop. This is our third annual workshop. Uh, this is uh, a time where we get together, we build something bee related. Uh, it's, the only thing I didn't put on there is the date. <laughs> so it's March 30th, March 30th. Um, these have historically, it's been a blast. Um, we'll get together, what? 
morning. <laughs> no, it's 9 o'clock. If you register, we'll get you the information. It's going to be held in Zionsville. Um, we set up a, 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 a couple uh, who attend here regularly, um, have donated their farm and barn for us to work in every year. It's been great. Um, it's just north of Zionsville. And uh, March 30th, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be building nuke boxes. So if you need a nuke box and you don't have one, you don't want to pay the market rate, or you just want to learn how to make them, um, we're going to be putting those together. Cost will be 20 bucks a person. That'll give you one box. If you want to build more than one box, just keep adding 20s to it. Um, that's, that's cheaper than the catalog price for a nuke box, and you get lunch in the deal with that. If you're interested, sign up with Colleen in the back. She'll be happy to take your name, information, and your money. Um, this is coming up fast. We've got this meeting and next meeting before the event, so uh, please uh, sign up if you're interested. Like I said, we usually have a real good time. No bees. No bees. There are no bees associated with this. We've, this is where some of the confusion has come in the past. We're building a box. It's an empty box. It doesn't have any frames. It's just a box. But it's a good box. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, I do this every month of what's blooming, what's blooming now, this month, and then what's blooming next month. So um, let's get started because I need to get through this pretty fast. really that starts blooming here um, and sometimes it's in February sometimes the first part of March is silver maple the bees love it um, and it's the first pollen that they get to come in to feed the larva uh, another thing contorted filbert this is uh, sort of an unusual plant for here but it's actually gorgeous uh, you can see how it blooms and excuse me. <laughs> okay. It's also a very hazelnut. You can get nuts off of it if the squirrels don't get it first. Okay. Uh, the little catkins that you these catkins are male. See that flower way up there? That's a female flower. So the uh, they get the pollen off those catkins and the nectar out of the uh, okay, witch hazel. Uh, this grows around here. You probably don't notice it much. It does bloom very early, and um, it's a pretty good source. And that's what a witch hazel tree looks like. It's kind of a small tree, large shrub kind of thing. Okay, um, we're getting into the spring bulbs a little bit. Winter aconite uh, is an excellent pollen and nectar source. Um, hellebores. Um, these are also called um, what, Easter lilies. Easter, Easter, I'm sorry, Easter rose. Linton rose. Linton rose. Uh, I'm sorry, I just know them by hellebores. Uh, I have some at my house. The bees do love them. They bloom early, but if you catch a good, pretty day, the bees will be all over them. This is how they looked last year this time. This year this time, they're covered with snow. Yeah. But if you look down into them carefully, you see that there's a new growth there, and right in the middle of that pink thing is the bloom. So even at this time of year, it's getting ready to bloom. And if we get a couple of warm days, They'll be blooming like that. Okay, March. Red maples start blooming. Look like that. Glory of the snow. You see these around a lot in rock gardens and that sort of thing. Crocus. Um, any type of crocus. They're a great pollen source. They're a good nectar source. If you're looking in your hive and you see this bright orange pollen, it's probably from a crocus. Snowflakes. Pussy willows start blooming. This is an interesting one. It's Siberian squill. Um, it's a spring ball, but the fun thing about this is the pollen is bright blue. 
So if you look in your hive and you see some blue spots in there, it's not things going bad. It's from, they found some Siberian squill. They're great. Last year, a gentleman had a picture of this bee that had some uh, blue pollen on it. Is he here? No. Okay. I should have asked him for that picture. <laughs> okay, next. Okay, Persithias have nothing. Do not plant Persithias thinking that, oh, these are going to be great early sources. They're not. Nothing. They're pretty. So are daffodils. The benefit of daffodils is nothing. Eat them. Deer don't eat them. Chipmunks don't eat them. Voles don't eat them. Bees don't eat them. Uh, they look like they should have, you know, lots of... Uh, pollen and nectar, and they may. The thing is, what I'm thinking is that because nothing eats them, the nectar probably tastes gross. <laughs> so anyway, the bees do not like them, but I have a bunch of them at my house because nothing bothers them. Okay. Now, talk a little bit about planting for spring. Some tips. Um, research when it's safe to plant. Don't get too excited if the weather starts turning warm. Um, I have rosemary versus basil. Rosemary you can plant and it's good down to about 20 degrees. Basil, if you plant before June, you're going to lose it. Because if it gets down to 40 degrees, it gives up. It just says no. Um, our, and when you're reading things, it says plan after last frost day. Our last frost day is Mother's Day, which this year is the 12th of May. Okay, to prepare your soil, we have this wonderful Indiana clay. Again, don't get too ambitious and start early, because if you start digging in that stuff and it's wet, you're going to end up with basically rocks. So um, you can modify the soil by adding organic material. I said don't add sand. Um, sand and clay form adobe. So you don't want to add sand unless you're adding a large amount of organic material at the same time. Then you can toss in some sand and it's okay. But you think, um, I have these tiny little pieces of clay, I'm gonna add something large to it to break it up, that's not gonna happen. Um, I say bathtub. If you're planting especially a tree, be very careful about modifying the soil. Typically, I don't modify the soil. The reason is, think about it, you're digging down into this clay and you have this big hole and it's solid stuff out, that clay is just hard. And you modify all the soil that's in it. What happens when it rains? All the rain goes down into the hole and stays there. It cannot get out. So you can add a little bit, but not much. The trees, particularly if you're plant, planting native trees, um, their roots typically are about a foot under the ground. They grow roots out, not down. So when you plant a tree, plant it at the depth that the bottom of the ball or whatever you're getting sits right on the bottom of the hole. Okay. Uh, shrubs versus perennials versus annuals, they all have their uses. Um, shrubs are great, they have lots of flowers at one time, typically they bloom once a year. Perennials um, are, are gorgeous, we like them around our houses, they're beautiful. Um, they bloom one time a year, sometimes for quite a long time, but some of them bloom again. And then annuals um, bloom all summer. So they're great. Um, each has its use. And the next thing, not what's supposed to be on there. Uh, don't plant a tree too deeply. Okay, you look at this tree. Looks like a telephone pole going down into the ground. What happens is several things. The roots cannot get air, so it starts this. Well, let me back up and say, I work in the education, I volunteer in the education uh, area at Purdue Extension, 
And this is the biggest thing that we get, questions about why isn't my tree doing well. I planted it three years ago and it's just, every year it just gets a little worse. Probably plant it too deeply, that's the number one reason. If you plant it properly, the root ball that you have goes right down on the bottom of your hole. You start to see the flare here, the, where the roots start out. Um, if your tree is so small that you don't have a real flare in it, make sure that the first root that comes out is right up at the surface of your planting. If you buy plants from nurseries in tubs, bare root, uh, not bare root, I'm sorry, in balls or whatever, be very careful about planting them because they've been grown outside in the nursery. The uh, mower has come by and mowed and thrown a bunch of uh, grass in on top of them. If you look at that, the surface of that may be two or three inches or more um, deeper than what you want. So you need to pull it off until you see that first root. Okay? Okay. Um, oh, mulch, two to four inches. Go to the next one. Okay, this is what we call volcano mulch. Okay, it's horrible for the trees. It causes the bark to rot. Again, it wipes out um, the air to get into the roots. If you pull this away, you often see girdling roots, roots that are curved and go around the tree and eventually cut each other off. So um, don't do that. When you mulch, two to four inches is plenty. Um, and we'd rather see you take your mulch out farther than just do a pile of it like this. Um, they tell us that trees planted in the city live 10 years. This is one reason why. Okay, leaf you. How do you help the bees plant more flowers? Yes, sir. I have one question, and it's been debated. I really think I have a good answer for it. You buy a tree, it's got this big fur lap wrapping mm -hmm. in a cage a lot of times. Come off of that. Um, it depends on first the burlap. If it's treated burlap, the roots are not going to go through it. Okay. In general, yeah, they're going to do this. In general, take the burlap and the metal off of it. Um, the metal, the roots can go through the metal, but what happens is they have it all tied up around the top. Be sure to get rid of all that tying around the trunk because it will choke it. Anything else? Yes, yeah, the, the, uh, a lot of nurseries put trees and they put it in a lot of sand. Yeah. So if you plant that, then you turn it into... Well, no, because you're not planting it with the clay. You just keep that intact yeah. and put it in. It doesn't hurt the tree. Wouldn't hurt it if you got rid of the sand. You know, but they have it because it's easy for them in the nursery so they know that they're not overwatering the trees and it's cheap yeah so um typically when you buy some buy a plant when you buy them in those pots oh if you buy it in a pot and it's root bound <clears throat> just take a knife and cut down on four sides of it yeah. about yeah. inch or so don't worry about your cutting and destroying these roots because if you don't do it, those roots, I don't care how big the area it is that you plant, those roots are just going to keep going like this. Okay? Anything else? Thank you. All right. I, uh, I'm going to breeze through a couple of things just because uh, we want to keep everything on the schedule tonight. Um, I did want to give you a real brief update on some legislation. Uh, the Beekeepers of Indiana has a legislative committee. I'm a part of that committee. And we had two things we were trying to do in the legislature this year. Uh, we're trying to get two specific bills passed. One was 
would be a bill that would prohibit municipalities and other governmental bodies from prohibiting beekeeping. Would allow them to regulate it and to allow them to regulate and to determine how many hives and where they could be on a property. They just couldn't prohibit it outright. Um, that bill right now is currently making its way through both the House and the Senate. Uh, I think it's coming up for its second reading tomorrow. Uh, it really hasn't been opposed uh, by anyone. Uh, it's passed committee votes 12 0 uh, already. And uh, Debbie and Mike uh, have been there for. Uh, for some of the votes in the hearings, so uh, that's been very successful, uh, and we we're, we're, have every reason to believe that we're going to be successful in getting that bill passed. If so, it would take effect in July of this year, uh, so we would be able to see some immediate relief. Uh, specifically, those of you who remember the the big issues we had with the town of Fishers. Um, what was the other city, Debbie? There's another city that has Hancock. Han huh? Hammond. I'm sorry. Hammond, Indiana. Yeah, Hammond, Indiana, also has a standing prohibition. So it would alleviate the issue for beekeepers in those areas. The second bill that we started with was a little more involved, and it had to do with deregulating some types of honey production. In other words, we were, we were trying to get a bill in place that would allow small to medium-sized beekeepers to be able to produce honey and to sell it at venues other than face-to-face. -face. So right now under Indiana law, I can sell to you I can sell to you, but I cannot sell you honey and you then sell it to this other person unless I have the appropriate licensing as a food producer, which a lot of commercial people, bigger people do have. Barry, Barry is all set up, but he can do that. The Sives can do that as well. Uh, but people like me who are much smaller producers, I can't do that. Um, we got the bill actually started through the process and the, the um, uh, legislature uh, encouraged us to meet with the State Department of Health, which we did. They were wonderful people. They were very cooperative. They worked with us. We had a great meeting with them, and we found out that we're going to be able to accomplish this, what we want, under the existing statute. So we will not need a new bill, a new law to make this happen. So stay tuned. They're going to be, uh, they've sent out some guidance. We're going to be putting together some training on how to do that, and that will be coming up probably in the next month or so um, as they finish that information. So just a quick update on the legislature. All right, changing gears, let's talk about uh, what's new in the literature. How many of you got your copy of the Journal of Economic Entomology? <laughs> <laughs> um, I know mine, mine was waiting on the doorstep for me. Now, this is a journal I have never seen before. Uh, Doug, uh, John Foster, one of our core members here, brought this article to my attention, and I'm thankful that he did because it was actually rather interesting. If you read any of the real technical literature, one thing you'll find is that they often spoil the ending in the title, okay? Because you know, just looking at the title, that colony size is going to be the right answer at the end. But anyway, let's talk a little bit about what they're doing here and why they were doing it. So bees have evolved these different ways of living with very cold weather. Um, what's not happening right now? Okay. There's nothing doing what? Nothing blooming. So there's no nectar. There is no pollen. How do insects, how do creatures who live exclusively on nectar and pollen survive during these long months when there is no nectar and pollen? Well, they've developed ways to do it. They decrease their activity. They stop rearing brood, which is very costly in terms of food and resources. And they create this phenomenal cluster that regulates their temperature inside the hive so that a tropical insect can live in sub-zero weather, okay? They've also uh, developed some changes to their physiology. They increase the amount of food that they store both in the hive and in their bodies. Um, they actually can switch a, a little marker to create bees that actually live longer. A worker bee in the summer only lives about six weeks. A worker bee in the winter can live six months, okay? And then there's also some changes in their endocrine profile and the way that their body actually processes um, things internally. Even with all of those great adaptations, still, you're looking at, on average, nationwide, about 30% of all colonies die every winter. Okay, so it's good, but it's not perfect. So one of the things you often hear people talking about is, well, if you want your bees to survive the winter, get those locally produced queens, okay? Get the local queens because they're gonna survive better. They are adapted 
to the weather where you live. This is one of those conventional wisdom things that everyone will tell you. And the idea here is that small populations within an area develop adaptations through selection that make them better able to survive in that area. The classic study was done back in England uh, right after the Industrial Revolution. There was a moth that was white, but about 3% of them when they were born were black instead of white. And they would rest on a gray tree and the black ones would be preferentially eaten because they were easier for birds to see. The Industrial Revolution came along, covered everything around the cities in soot. The trees that used to be light gray became black and all of a sudden, guess what happened? All the white ones got eaten and the black ones survived. And so in these areas around the cities, this species of moth only appeared in black. That's a localized adaptation. And the idea is, is that bees do the same thing. If you raise bees in cold weather, the cold weather tolerant part of that group will survive and they will become more and more cold weather tolerant. Okay. So there was a study done in Europe in 2014, and I won't go into all the nitty gritty of it, but it was two years long. And they took colonies from 16 different genotypes. And by genotypes, I mean locally adapted bees. Okay? They took bees from alpine areas and from coastal areas and from arid areas, all these different areas where bees had been bred for a long time. And they were an identified group of bees. And they put them in groups of 16 like this in six different climactic regions and said, I wonder how they're all going to survive. And oddly enough, they found that the population and survival and the population numbers survival rate percentage was the greatest when the bees that were adapted to that area were put in the area to which they were adapted. The mountain bees did best in the mountains. The coastal bees did best in the coast and so on. So it kind of follows you go, duh, I mean, why would we do a study to show us what we already know? Well, the reason is, is because a lot of things we already know don't always turn out to be true when we actually do a study and run the numbers. So the researchers who are behind this article that we're talking about tonight said, you know what, in the US we do not have these genetically identifiable communities of bees like this. Okay? All that previous research has shown is that there is a genetic difference between bees on the far west coast and the far east coast. But there's nothing to indicate that there's really a difference between bees that are in the south part of the United States versus bees in the northern part of the United States. And so they were trying to see if they could find a way to identify any differences that were there. One of the reasons it's often cited for this sort of homogenous universal mutt bee that we have around the United States is this right here. We ship packaged bees and queens all over the place. Okay? You know, most of us up here have had queens from the south or queens from the west coast or queens from Hawaii. Okay, or queens from Minnesota, who knows? But if you keep bees long enough, you're gonna end up with stock from all over the place. So, how did they design this study? What did they do? Here's their hypothesis. They said, look, the bee breeding efforts have produced these locally adapted stocks with higher overwintering success, and they're gonna do best in the climates where they, was, where they were bred. Very similar to the European study. We're betting that locally raised bees are going to do best in the location they were raised in. So they did a study. They took bees from a couple different parts of the country. They went up uh, to Vermont. And they got some queens that were locally adapted from up there. They got some from southern Florida that were VSH, varroa sensitive hygiene. These are essentially light mite biter bees. Uh, they got some bees from Texas that nobody knew where they came from. And they got some very purebred uh, Russian stock bees from West Virginia. And they got between 14 and 16 colonies of each of these types of bees. And they put them all in three different apiaries spread across central Pennsylvania, which was kind of a neutral ground. And they wanted to see who was going to survive the best. Does anybody know why this picture is relevant? Huh? This is really subtle. What's, what's the picture of it? What's the picture of Barry? I have no idea. It's Russian bees. <laughs> it's a Russian postage stamp. All right, so what was the study method? They put these bees in these apiaries and they managed them just like any standard apiary, nothing unusual. However, they did weigh the colonies very regularly. They gave them identical feedings, they treated them for mites the same way with MAQS, 
And over the course of the summer, they lost four of the 60 colonies. Actually, not a bad track record. After the summer, they did some genetic analysis, and they wanted to know if they could tell these bees apart just by looking at the genetic data. And what they found was, I found this fascinating. I don't know if anybody else does. But, <laughs> but they, they looked for markers in each one of these populations. And each one of those population markers is represented by a color up here. And I don't know how well you can see it, but there's a green, there's an orange, there's a purple, and there's a pink. And what they found was, was that they could generally predict where an individual bee came from by these genetic markers. If you look here in the south, south population one, it's got most of these green markers in it. That's their marker. South two, it's got more of these pink ones. Uh, north one, it's got more of these purple ones. North two has got more of these red ones. So they did find a slight genetic distinction between these regions. It was only about 1.7%. So it's very subtle, but it is there. One of the surprising things they found was when they started looking at survival. They had 56 colonies in October, 39 survived until April, eh, so-so. Uh, there was no significant difference in the different stocks that they looked at, none whatsoever. They all survived about the same, so kind of a failure there as far as a research topic goes. Uh, so north versus south bees, no difference there either. So local adaptation didn't seem to make any difference. However. What they did find was a significant correlation between hive weight and survival. This won't come as a surprise to most experienced beekeepers, but it's neat that they documented it this way. They found that the higher the hive weight going into winter, the more likely the hive was to survive. Looking at their groups of hives, nothing less than 10 kilograms survived the winter. That's about 22 pounds. Uh, if they were between 10 and 20 kilograms, they had about a 33% chance. Not so good. But as you moved up to 20 to 30 or 30 or more, the survival rate became very, very good. Okay? This is sort of ground truth in one of the old conventional wisdoms in beekeeping, which says take your losses in the fall. If you have a small colony going into winter, don't try and see if you can limp them through. If they're a small colony, they're probably not going to make it. Take that small colony, combine it with another medium or large colony, get yourself a big colony, and they'll all make it through the winter. Okay? So what does it mean? Well, what it means is, first of all, they didn't really show that locally adapted stock isn't better. That wasn't the purpose of the study. The purpose of the study was to see if there was a market difference in winter survival, and they couldn't show that there was. Doesn't mean there isn't, just means that their study didn't show that there was one. But they did come up with this very strong correlation to do with hive weight. The German study that I talked about earlier actually documented a very similar correlation. But they found that a large winter cluster, which we know from basic cluster physics, the bigger the cluster, the more bees it has in it, okay? It's like the old, you ever heard the old joke about the geese flying south for the winter? They always fly in a V. Do you ever notice that one side of the V is longer than the other? Do you know why that is? It has more geese in it. Okay. Same type of logic here. The cluster's bigger because it's got more bees. Okay? A bigger cluster, like a bigger animal, is more thermally efficient, which means it can, it can keep a unit mass warm for less energy. Okay? Energy is food reserves. Food reserves are what get your bees through the winter. So they end up with less per capita per bee honey consumption. So, a larger winter cluster has a better chance of survival, it's going to use less food, and, if it survives, is going to come into the spring able to better raise brood. So, that was really kind of the, the, the gist of it all. It was kind of a brief study, but I thought it was interesting because it really kind of drove home that, that idea of taking your losses in the fall. Any questions? Yeah, Bob. Then how can you get overwinter nukes? You can, but you generally lose more nukes than you will proportionally than you will full-size hives. At least that's the reports I've heard as I've talked to people. Yeah. So as an amateur, uh, so I've got a couple, how do I determine, I mean, the weight, do I, do I look inside to see how, how thick they are as far as bees? I mean, I mean I'm just, you know, I, I'm not, you know, I'm just kind of a beginner. So. A couple of ways you can look at weight. 
Um, you can look at weight in terms of combs of honey. Because when they're talking weight here, they're talking the entire weight of the hive. So obviously, number one, you can weigh it. You can hook a scale to the front edge of the hive, lift it up, look at it, hook it to the back edge of the hive, lift it up, look at it, add the two numbers together. That's a simple way to weigh it. You can use digital modern scales, Broodminder is one that comes to mind that will give you a running weight of your hive. You can calibrate yourself to just lift it. I mean, experienced beekeepers can hoist a box and say, eh, it's about 80 pounds, you know, and that's about 100 pounds, just judge by the pain in your back. Um, but you can also uh, you know, talk with someone who's experienced in the area and they'll give you an idea of you know, how much honey should you be seeing, how many bees, how many frames covered with bees should you be seeing. Okay? There, you know, this varies a lot from area to area, and I'm not even sure I could stand up here and give you an exact dissertation. I just look in and say, well, that looks about right. <laughs> uh, maybe that's another topic we should put together. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, how do you, you were talking about uh, weight as a determining factor. How do you determine whether it's the amount of honey that's left in the hive or how many bees are present? It's most likely, most of the weight you're seeing is weight of stores, weight of honey. The weight of the bees themselves is just a few pounds. So most so, of that, so most of that weight. It doesn't indicate how many bees you've really got in there. Right, and that's one of the reasons why when, when they study too, they talked about two factors. They talked about hive weight and they talked about population. Generally, they go hand in hand, but you do need to have both. You know, a hive full of honey and no bees is not gonna survive the winter. So you gotta be looking at the population size, the number of bees, as well as the weight of stores. But how do you determine the bee, amount of bees? You're gonna be pulling up the frames, looking at and see how many frames of covered with bees you've got. There's some simple calcs you can do. I, I haven't worked through the math on it though, but I think this is something we're gonna to have to talk about. It's a good topic. How do you estimate your hive population? Right. Huh? Ping pong ball, baseball, volleyball, basketball. That's what we call it. Oh, yeah, yeah, dear, cluster size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Well, we better give Dave an introduction. Dave's our featured speaker for tonight. Dave should have. All right, Dave. Dave. Dave, David Holka has been keeping bees for like 96 years. And he is, right now, he is the only EAS master beekeeper in the state of Indiana. Uh, so he spent a lot of time in study, a lot of time in research. He's killed a lot of bees to get to where he is today. And uh, he, has, he has historically been one of the best technical speakers we've had on beekeeping techniques, and we're very glad to have him tonight. So. So, those of y'all who think you're going to leave at 8 o'clock, <laughs> if you have to, go ahead. I won't stop. You won't bother me if you leave. I might, you know, the will be a Okay. Uh, tonight I'm talking about raising, not queens. Okay, listen carefully, okay? Not queens. You told me one of these ones. Quality queens, there's a difference. A queen is something you buy from Northern California. Okay? Send you, send you $35, they send you, they send you money. Okay? <clears throat> Quality. Alright? Uh, so, you know, kind of pay attention uh, if you want to. If you don't, they don't bother me either. <laughs> um, okay, so. Now, I'm going to cover a few questions here, and these are the questions I'm going to look at. Why should you raise queens? When should you raise queens? <coughs> Where should you get the eggs from? What do I have? What do I have to have? Okay. And how should you raise queens? Okay, and I'm not really going to tell you the answer to any of these. I'm just going to give you some ideas, and you'll have to figure your own answer out. That's what I'm good at, giving you ideas. And then you have to go okay, so uh, why should you raise queens? 
Okay, my experience with this is how, how many have five or less hives? Raise your hand. Five or less. Most beekeepers have five or less hives. Okay. Oh, and and you, you can leave. This is not for commercial bees. This is for the hive. No. Everybody has five or less. And this is what it looks like. Now, y'all can tell me if I'm wrong. Okay, but I'm going to tell you what it looks like. You have this one hive that's this big. Thousands of bees in it. It weighs 280 pounds. Bees coming and going all the time, even at night. That's the hive you tell everybody about. Everybody's got one of those, right? Right? You tell. So that's one. And then you have three. You know, they're okay. You know, they're okay. They get by. They do okay. You get. You get some honey, but not the you know 150 pounds you got off of this one. But you get some honey off of those three, but not much. And you don't talk about those a whole lot. And then you have this one. You know, my favorite one. You know, quit worrying about it. Just throw it out because you're spending all your time and your energy on that one, and these are getting neglected. But you know, that's what you got, right? Somebody tell me if I'm wrong. That's what I have. You know, most of the time, you have to worry about this stuff all the time. So why should you raise queens? You do realize, of course, that it is the queen that makes the hive. The bees in it do not make the hive. The queen is the colony. Right? Don't understand that. If she's bad, that's what you got. Why should you raise queens? To improve your bee stock. Now, why am I telling you this? If you don't do it, who is? You're going to depend on those guys from Northern California to send you the best queen they ever seen? <laughs> Are you going to if you don't, who is? If you're a beekeeper, guess what part of your responsibility is? Improving your bee stock. Otherwise, you end up with four of these and one another. So, everybody's with me so far? Anybody disagree so far? Okay, I didn't think so. Thank you. Earn a page. Sometimes I can. Save money. That's for me. I was looking at, just out of curiosity, I, I looked through some of the, uh, went on the websites today, OHB and different queen websites, strike-ins and different ones. Queens are going to cost 35 bucks this year. Plus shipping. Uh, you know how much it's going to cost you to raise a queen? Five dollars, maybe. You know, by the time you raise two or three queens, you can buy just about anything that you need. Okay? Save money. That's another reason. Here's, my, here's your best reason right here. To improve your understanding of bee biology. How many of y'all have no idea where a queen comes from? It just pops up. <laughs> <laughs> How I many of y'all understand how many days it takes from an egg to a queen that's laying? How many of y'all realize that they have to, that drones fly a certain distance from the hive and queens fly twice as far so they won't make with the drones and from their hive? You're trying to improve your understanding of bee biology. You do that by raising queens. Everybody got with me so far? Confused? Got it? Okay. That's why. And I'm sure that we can think of a hundred more reasons. Keep me from falling. Okay. All right, when should you raise queens? Not when you need one. It's too late. You, you won't be able to do it. And you can't raise a queen in a week. You know? And you'll be nervous, you'll be anxious, you won't do it right, and you'll screw up, you still have to go by one. 
So if you need one right now tomorrow, call another beekeeper that you know or get you, spend you $35 plus you can get one. But don't, you know, don't let urgent dictate when you try to raise a queen. Most of the time it won't work. Okay, when should you raise queens? All right, when there will be mature drones. All right, now, I'm going to put up here some criteria that I use for my first graph. Okay, uh, and with warning. Okay, sometimes my first graph won't work because it's too early. Nevertheless, some bunny bodies gonna call me and want a queen, you know, the first week in April. <laughs> you know, and I hate to tell people, well, I don't have one if I think I can help. So I always try this, and, and believe it or not, I get about half, you know, what I try to start out to do. So, but this is my criteria. There has to be mature drones. All right, you see this is the uh, but drone development to sexual maturity, queen development to sexual maturity. Where am I at? Hmm. I'm supposed to say day, day zero. All right, quick pressing the wrong button. Day zero, this is drone. Uh, three days of egg, seven days of larva, 14 days of pupa, and then 10 days to sexually mature. If he's not mature, he's not going to do any good. If he runs up to his queen, you know, it just ain't going to work. So this is a sexual, this is a mature drone. All right, this is queen. Okay. Three days of the egg, five and a half days, seven and a half days, four days to sexually mature. These two lines right here have to correspond with each other. Otherwise, you're doing nothing. If you come down here and you start trying, there I go again. You start trying to raise queens and you get her to hatch in 16 days and she's done at 20, you got no drones. So you have some pretty queens. They didn't help you. Because they're going to lose interest in going on maiden flights by the time you get sexually mature drones. So, here's a tidbit of information. Wait until you start seeing cat drone cells before you start worrying about <coughs> are you going to raise queens. Okay? You don't matter how early the spring willows bloom, if the drones aren't ready, you know, you're wasting your time. Uh, and like I said, this is my first. This is my first graph, you know. If you can wait another three weeks or another month, that's even better because it'll be, it'll be warmer, more chances of a better mating flight, more chances of uh, a, a, a lot of things going right as opposed to going wrong. <coughs> you know, if you have 10 days of rain, they don't fly in the rain. And your chances are gone. Okay, so this, this is a risky business right here, okay? If you start as early as I start, this is a risky business. But if those two lives at a sexual mature don't match up, you've done nothing. I'm gonna go to something else. I can start talking about certain things and keep writing. But yeah, how about this one? When you see bees forming queen cells, and that's a damn good time to start raising. <laughs> I always thought we let the experts, you know, don't raise queen cells, let the experts do it. Who's the experts? The bees. The bees are. So let's let them do it. Okay, so. Uh, when you see these in the hive, this is a swarm cell hanging off the bottom. This is a queen cell. A super seizure cell. Those bees know that they need a new, a new queen. These bees need it because they're going to swarm. These bees need it because they've determined that the queen that they have is insufficient for what she needs to be doing. So they start this. Now, I'm going to get, yes? Do you replace queens or do you let the bees do it? Do I replace queens? If I, I replace all my queens in July. 
How many years? Two years old? One. Somebody asked me how long my queens live. They'll be here till July. That's how long they live. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, a, a young queen, a queen less than one year old, gives out a lot more pheromones than a queen that's older. They're uh, less than, they're 30% less. 60% less likely to swarm than a queen that is two years old. Okay, The older the queen gets, the more likely they are to take off. And I do it in July because sometimes it don't take and I get to try again in August. <laughs> That's why I picked July. Let's go again. Okay, Sometimes you get, a, you get a, like what you think is a good queen in there, she turns out to be a dud and you can trade her out because you still have time. But if you change queens in October, that's your one chance, you know, you're done. So, right after I have enough bees for the honey flow, boom, done. Change them out. And let's see how it goes. All right. What am I, what am I doing? Okay, now I'm going to show you. I can't raise queens. I don't know how to do all that stuff. Watch this. I'm going to show you a one step method for raising queens. Okay? One step. So, here I am. This is a piece of equipment. It costs forty-four dollars a day down. I, I, I looked it up yesterday. Okay. It is called a queen castle. There's four compartments in it. One, two, three, four. Each. Can you see in that? Is that enough? Can you understand? It's four compartments. Each compartment has its own entrance. One, two, three, four. There's an entrance on all four sides. Each of the entrances go to a different compartment. Four compartments, four inches. One step queen rear. Oh look! A queen set! <laughs> In my heart! <coughs> Give me another one with honey and pollen, some bees on it. Close it up, come back in three weeks, she's in that land. You can't do that? <clears throat> okay. Everybody get that idea? I mean, I'm not trying to bore you, I'm trying to. <laughs> Don't go to sleep. I'm trying to expand what you know already, okay? Because I've known them I try. Okay. Everybody got that? Just how hard is that? Dave, yes. Can you check for your queen? Of course you should. Anytime you're moving queens and stuff around, I always make sure you're not moving her. Okay. If it's a supersedure cell, you have to understand there is a reason that they're superseding her. And sometimes you better off to leave those alone. Let them, let them do what they do. Until you lie. Then you take that. Okay, let them do what they do. There's raising a the supersedure cell. You know, if it's five supersedure cells and they're on different frames, take one. You know, just leave them a couple of supersedure cells. They they'll take care of business. That's what they do. They're bees. They've been doing it for 100 million years, and we've only been keeping them for like 7,000, so we know nothing so far. Okay. All right. Is that a hard method to raise queens? Yes, sir. When there's a queen cell in there, have you found that? The existing queen stays away from that cell, or not? Um, I, I, my, my personal feeling is if it's a supersedure cell, she knows. And she don't bother it. You know, uh, a swarm cell, she knows she's going to leave. Uh, I, I don't think the presence of queen cells or supersedure cells affects that queen whatsoever. Uh, She's not going to say, uh-oh, they're trying to supersede me. I'm going to start laying more. She's not technically capable. She's done her job. She's running out. She's running out of sperm. She's got no semen. She's got some issues that's causing some, some beekeeper, more than likely, was pulling up a frame and rolled her, you know, so that affects her, you know, flatten her out a little bit. She don't, her, her, uh, yeah. she's, you know, she's, she's injured. She's not going to be sitting outside that, 
queen cell waiting for that queen to hatch and kill her. No, she's not going to do that. She's not going to, if it's a procedure cell or a swarm cell, she's not going to, the only queens that are going to kill each other are virgins. Okay. So I've given you one way to run to, 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 to uh, raise queens. Anybody think they can't do that? Or needs further explanation? Okay. All right, that's one way. All right. One step method, boom, done. Phase two. All right. Where should I get the eggs from? Now, I, to make this simple, that hive I was, you, you got, you know, this one, that you want all your hives to be like that, where do you think the eggs should come from? <laughs> That way, okay, but I did put some criteria up here, and you will notice that I didn't put uh, local adaptive stock up here. Just so you know. <laughs> 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 I've known that for a while, but people don't believe me when I tell them. You know, they're like, we bury it, you know, four years ago, okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, your best honey producing hive. Your hive with best temperament. No, you don't want to raise Africanized queens. Believe it or not. <laughs> <coughs> All right, how about your hive that shows the best varroa resistance or treatment tolerance? That's a good criteria. Because if they're tolerating the treatments well and they're staying strong, you got something good going on. How about your hive that did not swarm? You know, swarming is partially genetic. And Unless you want to watch your bees fly away, you know, don't raise queens from that hive that you captured from that swarm. You know, don't raise queens from that. Yes, sir. Well, if you figure that maybe run fast speed and be a little bit better with queens. But fast? Yeah. You know, um, the, the problem. You know, I, I like buck fast bees as long as you've got pure, pure, oh, yeah, pure star. But you put out cystic, you know, and different things are important to different people, okay? And what I'm going to say may not necessarily apply to you, but when you put out 60 bucks for a queen like, because there's only two producers in, in North America that actually have the pure stock. There's some in the United States that say they do, but they do not. You, the only place you can get them is from Canada. Okay. And then you have to go through customs with the bees. It turns out to be a whole hassle. You spend a fortune, you waste all day, and you get your queen back. They're great bees. Okay. As long as you have that pure bug face. First generation. First, first generation past that, uh, most of them turn out to be pretty dog on me. Yeah. Okay, so you can buy the bug fast bees, and if you want to keep that strain, go right ahead. That's 60 bucks plus shipping from Canada plus, you know, go ahead and do that. If you are more comfortable with that, have fun. <laughs> I'll tell me, I'll go up there and get your whole load off. You know, and oh, yeah. we'll make sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Let me know. How do I get to on that? Okay. <coughs> You'll hide and did not swim. Okay. I can't tell. I got 10 minutes. You know, so this ain't work. All right. <laughs> what? What? I'm from the south. It takes me ten minutes to get my name out. <laughs> what? What should I have? What do I need to raise queens? This is easy. This is an easy list. A few extra nook boxes. You gonna have a nook box jamboree going on? You know, it's in this Yeah. See her. She'll help you with the nook box. A few extra frames. Easy, easy stuff. Cut cone foundation. Now people argue with me, I love this. Oh, I'm gonna use wire. Well go ahead. Use what you want. Understand if you raise a queen cell and just <coughs> remember where that wire is, you're not gonna be able to cut it out. You know, I'm trying to do this for the hobbyist beekeeper who might not understand all those little technicalities. Got this beautiful queen cell and I can't get it, don't help. Cut cone foundation, that's your fast bed. 
You have to have the ability to make a split. Those queen cells have to go somewhere. You can't just you know, put them in your pocket and the queen come out and then you go put it in the hive. It doesn't work like that. You have to be able to make a split. Now here's two, don't cost you a blank penny. A willingness to experiment. It takes more effort to raise a queen than it does to call OHB and give them your credit card. Okay. A willingness to experiment. Let me try this. <coughs> well, I didn't like this. Let me try it a little bit different. Okay. If you're not willing to do that, you know, maybe you need to reevaluate why you're keeping bees, period. Because it's all an experiment. You have to understand that. Right? It's keeping bees is one big experiment. Okay. And understand. I want you to understand. It takes an understanding that failure is an education when it comes to doing this kind of stuff. You know, it doesn't. If you fail, it doesn't mean you're bad. It means you just need to try something different. Okay. Don't take it personal. You know, I mean, I've talked with beekeepers who tried it and they get, they get so mad. You know, you talk to them. I grafted 27 queens and then virgin come out and busted everything. What? You learn something. Yeah, don't, don't get emotional about your queen. Make sure when you're grafting, you get all the same age, right? <laughs> get that when it's a day over. All right, don't take it personal. Okay. How should you raise queens? I, I like this, you know, because uh, different reasons. Uh, what you want to do is raise them the way that you most enjoy and are most comfortable with. Because if you're not comfortable and you don't enjoy it, guess what you won't do? You won't raise any. You know? Get comfortable. You, you're supposed to be having fun, not fretting. I can't grasp this, I don't like dealing with this, I don't like dealing with that. If you're doing all that, you're, you're missing part of the point of keeping bees as a hobbyist. It's different when you're a commercial guy, I understand that, you know. But if you are a hobbyist and you don't enjoy it, you won't do it. Now who's going to improve your stock? Okay, go ahead. All right. And the way you produce the number of queens that you need, you've got five hives. How many queens are you going to need? <laughs> probably, in reality, probably more like eight, because two or three of them are going to be on there. And then you want to have an extra one because your beefkeeper friends will call you up and say, hey man, you, I, I want my queen died. You got with you? I got one ring. That's how that kind of stuff works. Now, the way you enjoy it. Okay, now, these conditions must exist for you to raise quality queens. Not queens, okay? <coughs> quality queens. These three conditions must be met. The colony must be queenless, or they must at least believe they are queenless. Otherwise, they won't raise a queen. Why do we need a queen? Well, we got one. Forget it. The colony must be well populated. You cannot take you cannot take a uh, raise a queen with a tennis ball size cluster. They're not going to do it. There's not enough bees to feed them. There's not enough bees to take care of them. But I have had people tell me, "Oh, I grafted a queen and I put it in this nuke and I put 200 bees in there." Let's think about this for a minute. When a worker is being raised, it's fed about 150 to 160 times a day. A day. When a queen's being fed as a larva, I meant to say as a larva, I was talking about a worker, I probably didn't. But when a queen's being fed as a larva, it's between 1,600 and 2,000 times a day, once every 50 seconds. Your 200 bees going to keep up with that? <laughs> Everything else is going on in the hive? No. Okay. So it's got to be populated. It has to be 
when you raise queens, you want bees pouring out of this. You know, you want so many bees that I can't hardly get the lid on them. I can pack them down. <laughs> and a colony must be well provisioned. To make a worker bee, it takes one cell of honey, one cell of pollen, one cell of water. To make one worker. To make a queen, it takes three cells of pollen, two cells of honey, two cells of water. Okay. If it's not there, you're not going to get them. And that's just, I hope that makes sense to you. I don't know how I understand it. Okay. Well, I did this just for Jim. He likes his mathematical equations. <laughs> A, you know, it's our number. A, B, C, A, B, C, A plus B plus B equals a quality queen. Quality queen minus A, what you do not want, minus B, what you do want, minus C, what you do not want. You can get queens by leaving some of these parts out. Trust me. But there's no need to put a worse one in there than one of the ones in there already. All right, face. Next. Okay. All right. I don't know if y'all can see this or not, but here's a here's a very important factor. The younger the larva is, the better the queen is. Okay. Why? They start feeding her on day one. If you wait till she's three days old and, and they're feeding her something different already. You know, and then you try to convert her into a queen, you got not much. So this is the development cycle of a work of bees. You see, it's 21 days and you're out. I don't know if you can see this or not. Egg, day one to three, day four. When that egg starts getting a little curved, curved to it, just as soon as that egg starts curving, that's the one you need. And another feature would be they don't feed eggs. So the egg's standing there by itself. But if you look at it, you see it has a little bit of food around it, a little bit of larva around it. They're feeding it, so it's one day old already. Okay. So that's two key points. If she's curved a little bit, and if it's got food around it. Okay. Yes, day four, five, or six, is Gonna, I mean, day five, six, and seven is going to have food around it too. But they're more C shaped, okay? So you're looking for day four from the time it's hatched, from the time it's laid. One day old larva is the best. Okay. All right, when are we going to do part two? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, whatever method you choose, I think I hit this already. A, B, and C must be. Uh, <coughs> now, the following methods utilize a frame with foundation for cut cone, not plastic or wired. Uh, uh, explain the reason. Uh, try to get a queen, uh, get a queen cell on a piece of plastic and go try to cut it out, dude. <laughs> Or wire. You know right where they're going to make the queens at. Right exactly where that wire goes. <laughs> no, you can do it as a seasoned beekeeper. You can probably do it, but you have to, you know, be a little uh, more precise about what you're doing. But if you're just using cut comb, you don't have to worry about those things. Okay. All right, now. First method I'm going to talk about is the Hopkins method. This method requires a modified frame. Uh, just so it happens, I got one that I modified around here. Somewhere. Okay. Here it is. Okay. Notice I cut the ears off. I put little nails in there so I can hang it. That's so it will fit. Inside the box. Okay. All right. Now the Hopkins method. Uh, I'm going to tell you how. <coughs> like I said, it's published in 18, 
1886, first published. And beekeepers have been doing it ever since. So ask me whether it works or not. Does it work? Yes. <laughs> so you have, understand what I'm using here is old, nasty, black, ground up. It's not what you're going to be using. You know, it's not what you're going to be using. These are frames that I have called out, you know, that I'm planning on melting later. Okay. But uh, the first thing you want to do is put your cut cone foundation in. All right. It's going to look something like this. You know, this is not, not the best. Okay. Uh, and I put, if I'm raising queens with it, I don't go through all the trouble to use nails and all this stuff. Uh, and if you notice, uh, what I do is to, to put the foundation in is I'll, this is a candle. I light a candle, I'll slip a foundation in, and I'll hold it about this far up. And because if you put it right down here, you'll melt a hole through, through the, the wax. So you've got to let it drop two feet so it's cool enough not to melt the wax. Drop, 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 drop. Drop, 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 drop. I, I don't know, you can, you can see that it's in there, right? You can see that it's in there. That's how I put cut on foundation. And if I'm using it for queens, if I'm going to raise honey with it, that's a different story altogether. Okay? I'm trying to cut it All right, so you'll take and put a piece of foundation in and go to your... Now, you're going to go to the hive where you want the eggs from. Okay. Where you want the eggs from? The best hive. The best hive. Right. Your best hive meets any criteria that you set for. And you will take that and you'll take out a brood frame. And you will slip this back in the center between two brood frames. Now one thing bees do not like is somebody messing up their brood area. Now when you've done that, they're going to draw that out as fast as they can and she's going to start laying it as fast as she can because you've interrupted their brood area. So you're going to put that in and in a couple of days, you know, you're going to feed the bees to stimulate comb building. Okay, one-to-one, -one, sir, we'll generally get them to build comb. And you'll check this frame for eggs every day after the second day. There's no need to check it the first day, they're drawing it out. Second day, it might be eggs in it. Okay? Note the day the eggs appear. And when eggs are one day old larvae, that's day one, one day old larva, day one, one day old larva are present, remove the frame. Keep it warm. You know, if it's 27 degrees outside, you're pulling this out, you got problems. Okay. Now, here comes some more trivia about bees. I don't know if anybody knows about this, but I do, unfortunately. If this larva gets less than 85 degrees Fahrenheit, you, it's going to have a detrimental effect on the larva. 85 <coughs> or something like that. Or if it gets over 104, it's going to have a detrimental effect on it. So, what I do to keep it warm, you know, if it's 50 or 60 degrees, I'll take a gallon milk jug and a cooler. Most of the time I'll take two gallon milk jugs and I'll fill them up with hot water. Hot comes out of the, hot is, comes out of the faucet. I'll put them in the cooler and when I pull this frame out, if I'm going to move it back to the house to work with it, it goes right in. Close the coop. That's how I keep them warm. Okay. So it comes out. Keep the frame from. Now. I, I'm going to show you this a couple of ways, okay? Uh, I generally use a putty knife, and you have to pretend like this. Yes, sir. For your show and tell, you're showing a, a, a shallow going into a deep. Yeah. In real life, you're going to do deep to deep. No, what, 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 I use mediums. Sure. Mediums. Match. When, right. when I'm raising queens. 
even even if I'm putting it in a deep, I use a medium because I want them to finish it quick. I don't want I don't want eggs, uh, one day old eggs, two day old eggs, and three day old eggs. I want them to, I want them to be done. You know, go ahead, finish it, and they'll they'll hang the bur uh, they'll hang drone comb off the bottom. You just cut it off. You're done. <clears throat> All right, now, uh, I don't know if you can see this or not, okay? Remember, this is, this is a medium, clean, freshly drawn wax. This is not what I've got in my hand, okay? Uh, anybody know why I'm using fresh wax? That's the same. Anybody know? Soft. You ever seen, you, when bees are making queens, have you ever seen them reuse a queen cell? No. What do they do with them? Turn them down. <coughs> they don't reuse them. So that's a hint to me. Don't reuse them. You want them raised in luxury, clean as they can be. Okay? And you have to imagine that this nasty old thing is clean as it can be. <laughs> so in order to it's full of eggs, right? Not not really, but okay, so you want to go down, you're going to leave. <laughs> right when I'm doing this. <laughs> okay, so I, I, left a, I left a stripe of sales here. Okay. Okay. 
All right, and that's what I just explained, okay? On the fourth day, this is where I'm getting to, on the fourth day, after placing the frame in the cell builder that you populated hive there, you may check the frame for sealed queen cells. Okay. Be very gentle. Queen cells are like glass. If you shake them, if you drop them, you're going to kill the queen, okay? Or you can just leave them alone. If you're not that curious and you prefer a higher success rate, leave them alone. <laughs> <coughs> Be very gentle. Okay. Wait till day 10. <coughs> On day 10, they're safe to have. You can't throw them down, but the wings have developed, the legs have developed, everything's done. They're just waiting to finish hardening up a little bit before they emerge. On day 10, you go back, you pull, your, you pull it out, and you have queen cells hanging. And you can take your, get somebody to help you. You hold it while I cut, cut the queen cells out, and then you can put it in your little nooks. Okay? That's the Hopkins method, 1886. All right, okay. Now, I'm going to show you one different, a different way of doing this. I'm not taking the credit for this. Uh, all the credit for this goes to Mel Desicon. He's coming to... I'm going to show you this a little bit, but I'm not taking credit. This is his stuff. Okay? He will get very mad if I do this and tell you that it's mine. So I'm being real clear. This is not mine. This is Mel's. And if you want to know more about this, come to... The new, is it, what did you call it? Sustainable apiary. Sustainable apiary. Come to that meeting. And he'll, he's very, he's, uh, you know, a remarkable guy. I want to show you this. This is 25 automatic shells, okay? So I'm going to try not to drop you. It's kind of the same thing as I was doing, spacing them out. Just kind of take and, and push. You got eggs in there, remember? You don't push it all the way down. Just push it in a little bit. And you do this in your little places like this, okay? You know, I'm going to try to do this quickly. And you're going to be bugging it by the time it is. Okay? This is flour. Do not get the handcuffs out yet. This is flour. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, instead of doing all that, uh, Destroying the comb like I was doing a while ago, right? He's got the cells plugged up. Dust some flour down in down into it. The flour will dry up the larva that is exposed to it. And you pull the bullets out, do the same thing. Okay? <clears throat> Easy enough. But if you don't have a 25 automatic, that might be another problem. <laughs> okay. I'm going to try to get through one more real quick. <coughs> okay. Now, uh, I'm going to try to get through one more. Maybe two more. <coughs> That was the Hopkins method. The Alley method. Okay. Same thing. Put your sheet of foundation in. Cut the cone foundation. Put it in. <coughs> Take the queen jar out and lay in it. <coughs> Then, after it's drawn, you're going to take your knife, you got eggs in it, or you got one day old larvae, and you cut it out. It's kind of the same thing. Okay. Then you cut your strips. You got this full of eggs, so you're cutting the strips that are two or three wide. You got to limit. You go in, press. Place them out, same thing. And then you can take this and affix it to
this particular piece of comb that I've got is only drawn out on one side, so it's not it's not good on both sides. But you can press it on there and it will stay. And then you put that in your put that in your cell filter, and the bees will draw it out, just like it would be drafted. That's and, and, and everything else is the same, okay? Four, day four, day five, day ten is when you get them, okay? Then you can cut them very, very carefully loose. All right. One more. All, all this is the same. From day ten, you can cut them out, okay? All right. The Miller method. <coughs> this is really. Uh, one that I like, although I graft these now, I graft them. I'm going to talk about the Miller method. You're going to take a sheet of foundation and you're going to cut these V notches in. See this? All the way across. I just did half because I needed half of it. For... <laughs> Alright. Put it in. Let the bees draw it out. Pull it back out. When you pull it back out, it's really going to it's really going to look something like this. It's not going to be a V anymore because the bees are going to fill it in. But the problem you have is right around these edges, what, what are they going to lay? Drums. Drums. Okay. So then you have to take it and cut it back into a V. So you're cutting the drone off. I'm not going to do them all, I'm just going to do them one so that, you know, you can see. But you cut them back to a V and you've got eggs in it. Same thing, crush, 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 put it in. Whereas a fertilized egg, they'll make a queen. <coughs> they don't have them. Are you laying down flattery? No, this just goes straight up and down, just like... <coughs> the the, the uh, alley method, just like the last one I showed you. You're putting it back in the hive that has a queen? No, no, no it no. goes to a cell builder. And the only thing I'm using this big big queen is to, to get her to lay the eggs in it. It's, I'm leaving her alone. I'm just stealing some okay, eggs. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, is there anything here? That, yes, ma'am. When, when you're cutting out the queen cells, what are you doing with those? They're going into a new. How are you suspending them in the middle? Well, it's on. Yeah. Uh, it's a peanut, so we're It's a peanut. Uh, I, I use a couple of methods. You can you can actually buy uh, these little cages specifically made for this. You can put your cell in it and push it in. It's got two pins and you can push it in. But many times, many times, I can just put it in and just you know, just push it. Just oh, stick it between the hands and just push it. You don't like smash it, but just, you know. Especially if you've got enough room, you can leave a big area around it. Okay. You know, I got, I got more stuff, but, you know, I'm 20 minutes late. <laughs> no, this last one is... The clove board method, and this takes a long time. So, you know, unless you just want to hang around and me go over the clove board method. You got enough to digest. <laughs> if you want to leave, go ahead. I got no problem. You know, I don't know if you got any other things. We still have one, we still have some stuff to do here. Okay. Thank you.